This is the Axon 7, and this is going to be my shorter, less in-depth review. I did a much, much, much longer one, which I'll link to in the description below for you guys, but I figure not everybody likes the 30-minute videos, so I'll do a short one here, just kind of going over what I like, what I don't like. And let's just get started right away, and we're not actually going to start with the phone, we're going to start with what HTC, it's HTC, what ZTE includes in the box, and this is a case, and uh, I love that they did this, because... I have to buy all my cases from Amazon typically, and I hate waiting a couple days and using the phone without a case. I get all nervous. So the fact that they included one is phenomenal. I love that. They've also given you, you know, obviously you get the SIM ejector tool, but they give you this little case with it uh, that you can attach to your keychain in case you're one of those people who needs the dual SIM cards and, and or excuse me, who wants to swap out SIM cards all the time. It's nice to have that. Uh, good gesture on their part. Let's talk about the fingerprint sensor. It's on the back. That's not my favorite placement. I would prefer that it's on the front on the bottom if at all possible. Uh, I know Google loves it in this location. As far as the accuracy and the speed, I'm just going to put my finger next to it uh, on the side of the phone so you can see how accurate it is and how quick it is. So not bad. I'm actually pretty impressed with how fast it is. I would say it's not quite as fast as the OnePlus 3T, but it is really fast. My issue so far has been accuracy, especially if my fingers are, are sweaty or a little moist or if they're wet, like if I just wash my hands, uh, it's not going to pick up most of the time. I'd say on, when I was using this as my daily driver, maybe 75% of the time the fingerprint sensor worked for me. Um, so it was one of the more frustrating parts of the phone, but it's not a huge deal. Again, the phone's 400 bucks. So let's just keep that in mind as this review moves forward. You've got front firing speakers right here, which are just outrageous. They're really good. They get crazy loud. Sound quality, in my opinion, the only thing that beat this out is the HTC 10, and a lot of people are going to disagree with me on that one. I preferred the general quality of the sound from HTC. These get louder. I don't think that volume equals quality, and a lot of people just assume that uh, in a lot of reviews that I see. But it sounds really, really good, and it's very close. It's got a headphone jack on top. I was not overly impressed with the sound quality coming out of the headphone jack. Uh, I know it was one of their main selling points. If you go into sound here, you scroll down to headset hi-fi. You've got two options. You've got standard and super. And for whatever reason, in my opinion, standard just sounds miles ahead of super. I'm a reasonable person. I would assume that super is going to sound better than standard. And in my opinion, that's not the case. I think that for super, they've got this weird EQ thing going. It just sounds dull. It sounds flat. It sounds thin. Standard sounds as I would have expected it to sound. Um, but that is to say not quite as good as a phone like the HTC 10 or the LG V20. And honestly, in my opinion, the iPhone 6S Plus sounded better through the headphone jack uh, than this one did. And I'm not going to comment on what the iPhone 7 did, but it is what it is. Uh, you've got the camera on the back here. I'm not a camera guy. I am not going to really be able to comment a whole lot on the camera quality other than that I was not displeased i was impressed sometimes i thought the camera was good enough for a 400 hundred dollar phone i mainly use my camera for taking pictures of my pets when they're making stupid faces and i'll send them to like my mom or something on snapchat something really dumb like that right the camera worked well for that and I, it actually impressed me for a couple photos it took all my pictures are mostly indoors i don't do a whole lot of outdoor shooting i don't do a lot of low light shooting so if you're looking for an in-depth camera review i think pocket now does a really good job with those in-depth camera you know they know a lot about cameras i don't so i don't want to sit here and basically just make shit up about the cameras but for me it was good enough if you're one of those people who just wants to pull your phone out and take some pictures this is going to be fine for you let's talk about these hardware buttons and the navigation buttons excuse me on the bottom here uh, they're kind of painted onto the screen and they're just garbage it's it's really shitty they're not backlit so if you turn the lights off it's just black you can't see anything you can swap them out in the software which is nice but they're really close together. It's definitely my least favorite part of the phone from a hardware standpoint. I do not like these buttons, and I hope that they move to a software button in the, the Axon uh, 8 if that ever comes out. Uh, the, speaking of other buttons, you've got the volume rocker here, and you've got the power button. These are the same texture. Not a huge deal. I like how HTC does it, though, with the power button being this kind of like ridged, jagged texture. I wish that they would do that on here, but not a huge deal. The other thing that I really like that they did is it's a, the storage is expandable so you can actually open this guy up uh, and you can put an SD card in here which thank God 
Uh, I wish every manufacturer did this. I don't know why they don't. I mean, I do know why they don't, but I just wish that that wasn't the case. The really cool thing about this is that you've got a slot for your SIM card and then your SD card, but if you don't care about SD card expansion, you can actually put a second SIM right here if, if that would be preferable to you. So this, is, to me, is the best way to do that. You give people the option of dual SIM or expandable storage. And I'm looking at you, OnePlus. I don't understand why you guys couldn't put something in place like Axon does, considering you guys are basically the same price. So just to kind of tie up everything from a hardware standpoint, I'm really impressed. It's a 5.5 inch screen with a curved back right here. Probably one of the heavier phones that I've used and one of the better feeling phones in the hand. It just feels really, really good. It feels really premium. The camera, in my opinion, is good enough. Front firing speakers are great. Headphone jack is more than adequate above average. I just wish that the buttons were software keys or kind of like how OnePlus and HTC, 10, HTC does it on their 10 uh, and the fingerprint scanner was a little more accurate when your fingers are wet. But on, honestly, from a hardware standpoint to tie everything together, I'm impressed. And that brings us to software, which really is where I start to uh, be reminded that this phone costs $400 and it's, it's really the weak point of the phone for me. And I'm going to start this off by saying the phone is not laggy, the phone is smooth, I haven't had to reboot it like I do with the LG V20 almost like every other day. Uh, the apps aren't randomly closing all the time like they are on the V20. The phone is fast and I had no issues with speed, uh, bugs, anything like that. The problem for me on this phone is attention to detail and I'm just going to give you guys a really quick example. Let's take a look at the quick tiles here. You bring them down. First of all, this is nitpicky. I hate this animation. I just think it looks pretty cheap. You go to edit. You can move these around. You can drag and drop, which is nice. You can't delete them. They're stuck here forever, which is strike one for me. I don't use more than half of these, and I wish I could just remove them and take them away. But the problem is when you swipe down, you know, obviously the top five are going to stay here for the quick tiles. When you bring it down, you're stuck with these. They're here forever, and it always takes up the whole screen no matter what. The other issue I've got, when you click edit, you can see ultra power saving and the dual SIM settings. These two guys in the corner, I don't know if you can quite see uh, in the footage, but the G under settings and the G for saving is cut off at the bottom. Is that going to affect you in day-to-day -day usage? Absolutely not. Is that a huge deal? Absolutely not. But it's an example of software problems that I have with ZTE. Uh, they use, if we go down to about phone, it's called Me Favor UI. Some reviews I've seen have said that it's close to stock and I'm going to respectfully disagree. I'm going to say that they've made some changes away from stock and they've all been for the worse. I can't really think of one thing here. Maybe just one. Maybe this guy. The ZTE locker is really the only thing where like, oh, that's kind of neat. I, I don't mind that. And, and um, Google almost implemented that with the Pixel, I think, something close to this. You can see the lock screen is changing every single time I turn the power button, I press the power button, um, which is a neat feature. The problem though is that, that it, because of that software, I'm pretty sure you can see, I'm pressing these at the exact same time. Look how much faster the OnePlus is. Oops, that wasn't even, but look at this. Now again, is this a huge deal? No, does this affect your day-to-day -day usage? No, but I notice this kind of stuff. Even when you're doing the double tap to wake, look at how long this takes. Now you might say, you're just kind of bitching about stuff that doesn't really matter. I agree, it doesn't really matter, but it adds up. These little tiny things add up uh, to the bottom line of your software experience, which to me is not great. So let's go back. Uh, let's go into features. Navigation keys, you can swap them, which is really nice. I prefer the back button on the right-hand side, so I love that I can swap that. Me pop. You got this little button that pops up. You can change this if you want to. Yeah, um, I actually prefer it to be the back button. So this will pop up. You can drag it around anywhere. It's persistent. It goes with you on every page. And you can actually swipe over, and it'll give you all these options. Uh, now, before the NuGet update, you would long press, and those options would pop up. That's not the case anymore. Now you kind of got to swipe, but it doesn't work every time, and it also moves it over, so I haven't quite figured that out. I turn it off. I don't use that. Gestures and motions. Double tap to wake, which is really nice. The problem is there's no double tap to sleep, so now i got to press the button again. Not a huge deal. I would have preferred that they had double tap to sleep on there. Uh, shake to turn on flashlight down here at the bottom. I thought that this was going to be the old school Motorola implementation 
where your phone is off. I'm walking uh, from the light switch into bed and I'm trying not to kill myself and I just do the chop chop. Unfortunately, I, I don't understand this at all. It only works on the lock screen. It does not even work when the phone is unlocked. It only works on the lock screen. Drives me absolutely crazy. I don't know why they would do something like that. Um, let, let's talk about the lock screen. The notification bell, the, oh, don't even get me started on this. By default, it used to be like this. You'd have to touch the bell and then your notification would pop up. Thank goodness they've added the option to disable that. Um, one of my problems with this now though is, let's say I'm listening to music. I just turn a song on. On the lock screen, the, the wallpaper does not display the album art of the album that I'm listening to. Any other Android phone I, I have does that. Let's just use this as an example. Music is playing on my OnePlus. Well, and of course now that, there we go. So now it's displaying it on the background. And that's how it should be. I don't quite understand why ZT hasn't done that. So it's just the little things with software for me that kind of drive me crazy. Uh, another example would be when you're quick charging, the percentage of the battery does not display on the bottom, uh, which totally defeats the purpose of me for quick charging because I, I don't charge my phone overnight anymore. I only charge it in the morning when I'm getting ready, and I want to quickly be able to view how much power my phone has, and I, I just can't do that. So it's these little nitpicky things that kind of culminate into a software experience that I do not like. Just to close this out, I want to talk about battery uh, for a little bit. And I was actually pretty impressed with the battery life on this phone. I was usually getting about four and a half to five hours of screen on time. Uh, now, I know screen on time is generally useless. I think it's a good baseline. Um, but, like, if you listen to music all day and your screen is off, that's going to kill your battery. And screen on time doesn't apply to that battery measure. Uh, so I just took a picture right here of my usage over a normal day. You can see my signal quality is just garbage. It's really shitty signal. So that generally kills my battery life for any phone that I use. So even with signal quality that shitty, I, I was able to get about four and a half to five hours of screen on time, which is impressive. Now, that kind of brings me to my closing point here, uh, just about the software on this phone. So for this phone, I found that I actually wasn't using it as much as I would in other phones. And, and at first, I was like, oh, wow, the battery life is amazing on this phone. It lasts me all day, easily two days if I wanted to. And then I started to think about it, and I paid attention to how I was using it. And it turns out I really wasn't using this phone as much as something like the OnePlus 3T, the LG V20. And it was because I didn't like the software. I, I actually didn't enjoy using this phone, which I love phones. I love messing around with phones all the time. I love all sorts of phones. I've got an iPhone 6S Plus that's jailbroken, and I mess around with that thing every day. For this phone, I didn't really enjoy using it from a software standpoint, um, and that kind of was a reason for me being impressed by the battery life. Now, it's still got really good battery life, uh, and it's still a really good phone. From a hardware standpoint, I'm really impressed for 400 bucks. The fingerprint scanner is good. The camera is good. The front firing speakers are amazing. The screen, in my opinion, is amazing. I, I loved the screen. Uh, gets really bright, too. I don't know if I mentioned that previously, but I had no issues in outdoor, with outdoor visibility on this phone. It just got, it was more than bright enough. It was really software where I started to take issue with this phone and started to get disappointed and was just reminded, oh yeah, yeah, this phone is 400 bucks. And it's the software things, it's the little things that ZTE does that someone like OnePlus doesn't do or that OnePlus actually does really well. And for a, a small Chinese startup, OnePlus really impresses me with their software. And that, I don't understand why a company like ZTE almost goes out of their way to make the software kind of shitty, honestly, at, at some points. But basically, that's not going to matter to a lot of people. I know there's a lot of people out there, my wife is one of them, uh, who would say, well, the phone is fast, the phone has good battery life, the phone works well. What's the problem? Why are you bitching so much? I care a lot about software, and I get really picky about software, and I know there are people out there who do. So for me personally, this is not the phone for me because the software just is disappointing, and it doesn't work as well as I wanted it to, and it doesn't work the way that I want it to, versus a phone like the OnePlus, running Oxygen OS, everything they add is really smart. Uh, I, I actually kind of prefer Oxygen OS over stock Android in, in some areas, which some people might think is blasphemy, but I love stock Android. I don't like skins like the Samsung uh, TouchWiz. I don't know if it's called TouchWiz anymore, but I don't like the Samsung phones because I hate their software. Uh, and ZTE, they're not as egregious as Samsung is, but they're 
I can tell they're trying to do similar things. Um, and I just wish that they wouldn't. I wish that they would stick to stock Android because stock Android is so good and you're going out of your way to make changes that are just not necessary. So the bottom line for me would be this phone is 400 bucks. Let's keep that in mind when I'm being picky about software. Do you care about software? If the answer is yes, get the OnePlus 3T if you can handle not having front firing speakers. If the answer is no, I don't give a shit about software. This is a really great phone for anybody out there. It works really well, especially with the speakers. It's fantastic. So bottom line, if you're a software guy or girl, I would stay away from this phone because you're not going to be that happy with it. If you don't really care about software, you don't customize a lot, you don't tinker, you don't really mind the way it looks, get this phone because it's a really good phone if you don't care about that. Uh, and that's really all I got. I've got another review that's more thorough in depth. Go check that one out if you guys need to. And uh, thanks for watching.